Good evening. Welcome to the Libertarian Alliance. We meet here every month. Uh, all meetings are open to the public and you're welcome to come along. Uh, tonight we have Sean Gabb, who's talking on art and, uh, and uh, libertarianism. And uh, are, is it uh, libertarians for the science? Is that uh, too much of a summing up or too much of a altering the title bit? Nothing wrong with being a Philistine. It's um, being a Philistine to no effect. Oh, you better. No, I'll hand it over to you. Oh, sorry, David. You normally make very long. Oh, do I? Sorry. That's your one. All right. Okay. Yesterday morning, I played truant from earning a living, and I published about 50 Libertarian Alliance videos. And among these were about 20 videos shot 25 years ago by David Botsford, who died at a ridiculously early age two years ago. David shot these videos um, with the idea of making a Channel 4 series called Voices of Liberty. He filmed quite long interviews with Chris Tame, with Roger Scruton, with Raymond Plant, with various national socialists and Greens, um, American libertarians who just happened to be passing through London at the time. It is a very interesting set of videos. He gave them all to me in December 2007, and assigned the rights to the Libertarian Alliance. The, edit, the, the videos are largely unedited, which makes for an often rather comical effect, because I didn't bother editing them, I just digitized them and put them online. What makes these videos, Voices of Liberty, so significant is that they were shot at the end of the 1980s. And they give a representative picture of where, at the end of the 1980s, most libertarians thought we were. We were young men at the time. Well, even David, he was quite young, wasn't he? In 1990. No, I was younger, certainly. You were 25 years younger than you are now. That's right, yes. Indeed, we were all 25 years younger, but we were all in our late 20s, uh, sometimes in our late 30s, but most of us in our late 20s, indeed. And it seemed reasonable for many of us to believe that um, the 1980s had been spent clearing away the rubbish. We had seen off the Labour Party, we had seen off international communism, we, we had defeated socialism, state socialism. It didn't mean that the conservative government of Margaret Thatcher or of Ronald Reagan was a, a, a particularly inspiring thing, but it had done its historic duty of finishing off old-fashioned socialism. It had cleared away the rubbish so that there could be, during the more creative period of our lives, that there could be a a growth of libertarianism. And if you look at those videos, Voice of Li Voices of Liberty, they, they do show considerable optimism. The, the only person who does not come across as particularly optimistic is a rather young Sean Gabb. Now, we're all 25 years older, and looking back, it, it is clear that in 1990, 1991, rather than having got ourselves to the point of takeoff, uh, the, the British libertarian movement, at the very least, had peaked. Sorry, I'll start that section again. It, it, it is clear today that by the end of the 1980s, libertarianism had not got itself into a position from where it could grow solidly and substantially. It had in fact peaked, and the next quarter century would be years of stagnation, 
or even of decline. Uh, and that has been the case. We are all of us, but by virtue of being here tonight, libertarian activists. And what, during the past 25 years, have we as libertarians achieved? Well, David McDonough here in his LA, they do an admirable job. Every month, regardless of local circumstances, they put on an event in this room, they find a speaker, they find an audience, and they, they show the flag. My LA, what do we do? We run a blog, quite a distinguished blog, quite an active blog. Television, radio, books, all of those things. We, we, we all do what we can. And those who don't do, contribute financially, which is always extraordinarily welcome. But what have we collectively achieved in the past 25 years? And the answer is that apart from keeping the movement in being, which I suppose is an achievement in itself, we have done nothing. Have we reduced the size of the state? No. Have we reduced the growth of the state below what it would otherwise have been? No. Have we had any substantial impact? No. No. It may be that in the United States things are rather different, though I doubt it, but I do know this country intimately well, and I know the British Libertarian Movement intimately well. And whereas in the 1980s it did look as if we might be getting somewhere, since then it's been either stagnation or decline. And I rather think it's decline. The rest of my talk, which will not be very long, deals with two questions. Why are we where we are? And how do we get from where we are? And I'll, deal, I'll try so far as I can to deal with them together. Why is it that we have at best stagnated over the past 25 years? The answer is because we are intellectuals. Now, I know that in the 80s it was popular to regard intellectuals as being was it dealers in second-hand ideas? It was our job to take the ideas of Hayek and Friedman and von Mises, etc., and to translate these into messages that people at bus stops would eventually begin to parrot. I thought at the time this was a stupid idea, but I didn't uh, make too much fuss about it. Again, it's something that hasn't worked. We, we haven't even converted the other intellectuals. We, we sit around in little intellectual groups talking to each other. I remember when we still ran Libertarian Alliance conferences, some ghastly German whose name I won't mention. Um, I gave him 20 minutes, but he turned up with a stack of papers half an inch thick and said, no, I have come all the way from Germany. I will take as long as it takes to give this speech. And I thought, oh, God, that's lunch gone, isn't it? <laughs> anyway, I remember he began his speech with something like, as Ludwig von Mises says in chapter 870 of his seminal work, Human Action, and because I was sitting at the front of the National Liberal Club, I couldn't obviously fall asleep, but I did my best to disconnect in a rather Buddhist way from the proceedings around me. This is not the way to win debates. This is not the way to influence the world. How did the lefties get to their current full-spectrum hegemony? Oh, questions are later on, but you, you, you tell me. No, no, I, I wanted to give an answer, try to give an answer. Go on, then. By appealing to humans' sentiments, mm. not their reason. That's right, yes. The left has got to their position of full-spectrum hegemony, partly because they promoted each other while we promoted them. 
but also because they were not that terribly concerned about intellectual arguments. Do you think in the 1930s, 40s and 50s, the lefties spread their message by publishing the works of Karl Marx and, and getting people in the Dagenham car factories to read them and to understand them? I don't think so. Do, do you think that they have ever spread their ideas as assiduously as we have tried to? The answer is no, quite plainly not. The lefties achieved full-spectrum hegemony by concentrating on the area of culture. If you take yourself back to about 1950 or 1940, you will see, what will you see? In England, you'll see the novels of J.B. Priestley, the plays of George Bernard Shaw, the, the various works of H.G. Wells, the output of the BBC. If you go to America, you'll see the novels of Howard Fast. Some of them are very good. You'll see the output of various Hollywood film studios. Um, who's that man whose surname was Ford? Harrison. No, no, no. 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 Um, Henry Ford. No, no, no. no, 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 the, no, no. the film director. Yes, yes. I can't tell you. Doesn't matter. Henry Fonda tended to star in most of his films. Glenn Ford, that's the. No, one. no, no. no. Yes, Glenn Ford was a film movie star. Hmm? Keep moving. It's yeah, a director's thing. Well, it doesn't matter, but the point is the Hollywood Film Studios. Those are the people and the organisations that spread leftist ideas. And they didn't spread them by telling people, wouldn't it be a good idea to nationalise the means of production, distribution and exchange? No, what they did was they created a narrative. They created a view of the world within which arguments about nationalising the means of uh, production, distribution and exchange began to make sense. Did it, has anyone ever watched um, J.B. Priestley's play? It was a very good film with Alistair Sim and Inspector Falls. Yes. W would you agree that it, it is a masterpiece? Mm -hmm. It's a very good piece of theatre and it translates very well in, or, onto the big screen. This is a play put on during the Second World War. A, as I said, a very good play. Very well filmed. And what it does is to delegitimize the entire past. The past was a bad time when dismissed scullery maids drank bleach. Libertarian Alliance. No, not Alice Cash. No, I'm sorry. That's all right. Try the other end. All are welcome. They're not all attend. <laughs> the, the past was a bad time when dismissed servants had to drink bleach because they'd been got into trouble by the young man of the house. And the inspector who turns up gives a long speech at the end about how we really do have duties to each other, not simply rights against each other, and we need to live in a world in which these duties are accepted at least as strongly as the rights. I read this for O-Level, I saw the play when I was a boy, and um, obviously I would take issue with certain aspects of the play in its factual sense, uh, and also in um, terms of narrative, but it's a very good piece of theatre and a very good film. And you can go through all of the rest of J.B. Priestley's early output. Oh, and the early output of George Orwell as well. And although I find George Bernard Shaw um, a, a, a disgusting old windbag, <laughs> he has his moments, and H.G. Wells is always worth reading. These are the people who won the argument for socialism in this country during the early and middle years of the 20th century. No one read Harold Lasky, no one read, uh, no one read any of these Marxists, they're, they're all forgotten. 
There are no significance. Even people like Ivor Jennings, who had some influence on legal education, they had very little long-term or, or in their own day substantial impact. Long-term substantial impact came from those novelists. And in the United States, it didn't come from a few fringe <coughs> Jewish lefties who mostly got electrocuted in the 1940s when they were caught giving atom bomb secrets to America. It, it came from the Hollywood studios, it came from the mainstream uh, of people creating a certain narrative within which socialist arguments made sense. And they won. And when those, when that particular narrative of state action to raise the condition of the working poor or thin, why in the 1980s a new wave of leftists took over the culture. Jonathan Ross is quite an important part of the cultural takeover of this country. So is the soap opera EastEnders. So all of those things, they're all very important because they established a new narrative of political correctness. Again, no one reads The New Statesman. No one ever read New Society. Uh, no one's read the various works published in English of the political correct, of the political correct. Very few people have read Marcuse on repressive tolerance. No one reads Gramsci, even in translation. Some people read Foucault simply for the entertainment value of seeing what crap he mostly was, but um, th these are not household names. But uh, what the disciples did was to take over the culture. And they succeeded brilliantly. And so, you have people like us sitting around in small meetings talking about various chapters written by von Mises and discussing whether Hayek's um, analysis of intellectuals is entirely correct. And it's not surprising that no one takes any notice of us. It's not surprising that we have absolutely zero impact on the world around us. And so if we want libertarianism to become a living force within this country, we need to spend less time on discussing what von Mises may have said in a certain chapter of um, his book on socialism. And uh, let me put it this way. If I had 50,000 pounds to give to a libertarian cause, I would rather give that £50,000 to putting on a ballet about the early years of von Mises in Vienna rather than yet another set of books by someone like Eamon Butler about the economics of Ludwig von Mises. The reason is that no one reads books by Eamon Butler. I'm a no one. I read them. Uh, I put a load of them on Amazon a few weeks ago because I needed the shelf space and they're going for a penny each and no one's bought them. Just because I've already done. Nobody, <laughs> nobody reads these things. Look, I have nothing against Eamon Butler, nothing in particular at any rate. <laughs> the, the problem is that these books are boring, nobody reads them and they are of no use. Whereas the culture is wide open. The lefties took over, not because their arguments were better, nor even because they were any better at arguing, but simply because they concentrated on what was important, which was establishing a narrative within which lefty ideas made sense and could make headway. And the reason we are such, the reason we are such notorious failures is because we concentrate on intellectual arguments, which may well be true, but which get us absolutely nowhere. And if we want to get somewhere, then we need to start looking at the means of creating our own counterculture, because we're not capable of taking over the existing cultural institutions, and of getting our own counter-narrative out there so that people can at least look at it 
And if they accept our counter-narrative, then you might find that they begin to accept our intellectual arguments. If you look at the reasons why libertarianism does slightly better in the United States than in this country, it is because there is a libertarian counterculture in, the, in that country, and a counterculture. There are novelists like L. Neil Smith and J. Neil Shulman. There are filmmakers like the people who made Ferris Bueller's Day Off. They are the people who keep libertarianism alive in America. It's not the von Mises Institute, it's not certainly not the Cato Institute. These may be well funded, but the reason why they're well funded is because there is a libertarian culture in the United States which exists at the level of popular culture. In this country, we, we really have nothing. Libertarian has no traction because we have no presence in the arts. We need libertarian novelists, we need libertarian musicians, we need libertarian artists and playwrights, we need libertarian theatre directors, we need libertarian filmmakers. Uh, of course, it is very difficult to do all this w without money. But instead of putting money into yet another think tank, the John Bright Institute for Limited Government, which will argue for public-private initiatives in healthcare reform, you know, utter waste of money, which may make a few pennies for certain people, but will do nothing to advance the libertarian argument. Instead of pouring money into these waste of time organisations, we should be putting money into libertarian poetry, libertarian ballet, libertarian novels. You may say, well, of course he's singing his own song, isn't he? Because he makes most of his money from writing novels. But I'm not a libertarian novelist. I'm a libertarian who happens to make money from fiction. There is almost no market in this country for specifically libertarian fiction. I wish there were, but there isn't. I do it from duty. But most of the money I make is from fiction which has, at the very best, a subtext of libertarianism. But we shall never get anywhere in this country until we stop focusing on yet another publication about the... Um, economic calculation debate, or setting up institutes which will argue for the introduction of markets into defence procurement, we really shall get nowhere if we pour effort and money into enterprises like that. If we are to get anywhere, it is to look at the culture, because it is the cultural narrative that establishes the entire climate within which intellectual ideas seem perverse or sensible. And we haven't even begun to look at that. Anyway, that's all I want to say. Well, I think we'll find that people such as Bernard Shaw, before they were heard of at all, were caught by the ideas. I have no objection to people coming along dancing, singing, vocalising, symphony writing, filmmaking. But they have to get in contact with the ideas first. Now, of course, they may get into a film, but that filmmaker had to, they very rarely make them up themselves, they had to come into contact with something dry as dust, boring and tedious, as another chapter about Booty Von Mises, which I find gripping, I have to say, but there we are. Yes. Even I haven't written it myself. Yeah, okay, Stephen, but we spent 40 years writing dry as dust pamphlets about von Mises. And how many filmmakers have we inspired in the past 40 years? Look, that's, sorry, the Adam Smith Institute has burned its way through untold millions of pounds. How much, what influence has it had? How many um, poets and novelists and filmmakers has it inspired? And the answer is none, none whatever. 
Compare that with the compare that with the influence of the um, of the Frankfurt movement on popular culture. They were doing I think I'd say they're level. Who? I'd say they're level. Like Ordona and these are Frankfurt. Mark Hughes, as you mentioned, one. He said no one read him. You're quite right. Very few people have read him. Mark Hughes is better known than the others. Ordona and those silly idiots. Mm. They're, they're, they're unknown. They're, 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 people find out about them at college. But of course, the big. I I'm in the chair. So no, that's good. Okay. But, but the, 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 big, the big assumption here, which I think you've got wrong, though, is that the left dominate current society, which of course they don't. Uh, we might go to a leftist meeting after this and they'll say, now, why does the right dominate society? Why have we had Thatcher, Reagan, and so on? And they'll, no, but of course, they don't dominate society either. And of course, novels and films, they have, I would. We need the civilised number, zero, to sum up the, sum up the influence of novels and films. Uh, uh, but it's true that uh, the initial, uh, talking about Hayek and the ideas, the initial policy statement of the ELA, before that, Richard, we were talking about earlier, uh, talks about how easy it is for the enthusiastic propagandist to get over optimistic and then to lose his optimism. Therefore, then, the reason to go at the intellectuals it's not because uh, the, uh, the intellectuals are, uh, are particularly more fruitful, because the intellectuals are going to tolerate the propagandists a bit more. In, order to, in other words, the, the, the whole policy statement of the LA, written back in, in uh, around 1980 or thereabouts, was to keep these propagandists from cynicism, from despair, from pessimism. And the whole lot, it, it, we were not surprised, I mean, I'm not surprised uh, of, uh, of the progress we've made in the last 20 years. Uh, 25 years, ideas don't make, uh, uh, well, they, they certainly don't command novelists and so on. They never will do, not in a million years. And, and of course, it doesn't matter because novelists and, and films and so on are beside the point anyway, I think. <laughs> David, some of us have been in this movement not for 25 years. In your case, and almost in mine, we've been in it for 40 years, and 40 years is rather a long time in which to show a complete lack of success. Well, you know what Confucius said? Confucius says if you're going to get someone to change his diet, take 10 years on it. But if you're going to get him to change his mind, take a whole lifetime or maybe more. Yes, but 40 years, David, is quite a long time. It is a long time. But... What I would suggest... All right, let me ask this question. Forget the question. Or I think of sinking of glue. Communism. It's a very bad state to be in. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm going to sort of throw out just a, an idea or so. I suspect that, um, although I, I wasn't very in favour of what was going on at the time, I think you probably did achieve something in the Thatcher era, and that you had people who thought in a libertarian way, uh, at or near the top of the Conservative mm. Party that something seems to have gone dreadfully wrong since. Uh, and I suspect that would repay analysis. The other point I wanted to make is, of course, the, the left are a lifetime or two ahead of us, because they started, they called for a march through the institutions in 1968, and they'd actually been starting a march or trudge through the institutions much earlier probably as early as the Second, as the Second World War, when they got their hands on the BBC and the Ministry of Information and people and such and such and such and such, and started to become um, the cultural establishment, the cultural narrative that the arts existed to bring about a world of social justice in which everybody would be happy, etc., etc. Um, and one's tempted to say, well, if only there could have been some libertarian-minded artists and thinkers then, we might have made more progress. Well, we did make progress, Andrew, or at least we made negative progress in the sense that we stopped them from making such rapid progress. Look, um, if, you are, if you ask most libertarians what was the most significant anti-socialist publication in the 1940s, most would argue, oh, Hyatt wrote to serfdom. It was a seminal work. Yes, it was. It was brought out in 1944, and Labour won the 1945 election, hands down. And, uh, oh, there were also several communist 
members of parliament elected in that year. Hayek's book may have sold, it may have been discussed, but it had no, it had no particular influence. When you look, however, at George Orwell's 1984 and Arthur Kirstler's Darkness at Noon, what, what you see is an artistic counter-attack, an artistic counter-revolution, which destroyed communism in this country stone dead. Darkness at Noon in 1984 it, it, measurably were more important works on our side than The Road to Serfdom. For every one person who read The Road to Serfdom, maybe 10 or 20 or 50 people read Darkness at Noon or 1984, and they had a much longer lasting effect. Why, well, I, read, I read The Road to Serfdom in 1979 and thought, yes, this is all very true, very worthy. But um, several years earlier, I had read 1984, and, and that converted me on the spot. It made me a rabid anti anti-totalitarian, anti-authoritarian. Indeed, I read, in the same week as I read the, uh, uh, as I read 1984, I read The Scarlet Pimpernel, which made me into a rabid Tory for life. I read, I eventually read Burke's Reflections on the French Revolution, a, a, a most remarkable book, a most brilliant book, a, a, a work of the work of one of the great masters of English prose, but what hooked me in to Toryism was The Scarlet Pimpernel. And we're just not turning out books like The Scarlet Pimpernel, and that's why we have to meet in such insalubrious surroundings. <laughs> Don't you think that Len didn't meet in grossy pubs, not, not more than a few hundred yards away from the year? Do you think he had no effing chance to be of any importance in the world, except there was a world war. Well, there might well be another world slump. And this time, the Keynesians and the others have had full reach, full go at their solution to it. And if it fails, people just might look around for an explanation of why it had to fail. I should also pass, uh, point out at this point that if you read things like global warming skeptic size, you'll think there are tons of libertarians out there who have never heard of us directly. So libertarianism is out there more than you might think. Libertarianism may be out there, but let's go back to the whole question of Lenin and Bolshevism. Uh, Lenin won the um, Russian Civil War because he had people, because he killed more people than the opposition. The reason why Soviet communism survived and flourished, however, has less to do with the numbers of people murdered than to do with the, um, that, than with the artistic ability of those who believed in Soviet communism. You have people like Eisenstein, you have people like Shostakovich, you have, oh, in the 1920s and 30s, there was an enormous flowering of Russian Soviet culture. And that is what made the system so glamorous. That is what spread the message so effectively. It's not a question of how many people you murder. If it was just a question of how many people went to murder, Hitler would have lasted rather longer than he did. The, the reason why the Soviet system lasted so well is because it, was, it associated itself with such um, with such artistic excellence. I walk, even today, I walk around Bratislava looking at the upper parts of buildings. My wife doesn't notice them because she, was a, she grew up with them. And I see masterpieces of socialist realist sculpture looking down at me from the upper parts of tower blocks. You can go into the central post office and you can see masterpieces of oil painting. Um, Soviet communism survived and flourished, not because Karl Marx was a great and coherent philosopher, though he was a man of considerable ability, nor because Lenin and Trotsky and Stalin killed untold millions of people, but because it was part of an artistic narrative of compelling power. 
And can you think, do you associate the words artistic narrative of compelling power with free market libertarianism? I don't. David? Yeah. David. So, so, uh, you, you talked just now about what I would crudely describe as high culture. Uh, but I had gained the impression in your talk earlier that you were re really talking about popular culture or low culture. Now, I'm suggesting that these are clear cut distinctions, but I can't really believe that the fact that there might be lefties. Uh, who produce high culture and any bearing on anything. Uh, I could begin to believe, I'm not sure, by the way, that if lefties control popular culture, that could well be relevant in terms of uh, the extent to which people see lefty ideas as being natural. So are you seriously s suggesting that high culture has any bearing on? Anyway. Yes, I am. If you have a ruling class, sorry, David doesn't believe in ruling classes, but if you have a ruling class... No, I believe in a ruling class, it's just that I don't think they have any class interests. Very well, David. If you have a ruling class that is completely united, where the individual members are loyal to each other, then you will probably have a power system short of some natural disaster or a lost war that is effectively indestructible. And one of the things that holds together a, a ruling class is a shared culture. If you can show, if you as a ruling class can show patronage of what everyone believes to be outstanding high culture, then that has an enormous reinforcing effect on your class solidarity. One of the reasons why our own ruling class is rather shaky is that it has no high culture. Uh, when you saw the um, intro, when you saw the opening and closing ceremonies of the 2012 Olympic Games, for example, what you saw was embarrassingly bad. Uh, and um, if, if I had been Peter Mandelson, whom I've always regarded as the, uh, one of the Machiavellis of the, of, of the current revolution, if I'd been Peter Mandelson, I'd looked at this and thought, oh God, our term of power is limited. But um, to go back to your question, if you can control the popular culture, wonderful. You've got EastEnders. You've got the entire output of Channel 4 and BBC 2. Wonderful. You're going to win. But it's also very useful uh, to be able to show that as a ruling elite, you, you patronise artistic excellence as well. And uh, that, that is the important, that is the importance of what the Soviet ruling class achieved in the 1930s, 40s, and 50s, and even into the 60s. They, they patronized masters of the highest excellence. You, you can look, okay, there is a, it is fashionable to sneer at socialist realism, but if you look at the paintings, if you look at the sculptures, if you wander around um, cities like, uh, Bratislava and Kosice, uh, and even if you look at the outskirts of Moscow, what you will see is architectural excellence looking back at you from every street corner. And um, because my particular interest is in music, um, y you can see that there was a great deal of musical excellence in, in socialist realism. And that has an effect, that has a legitimizing effect on any ruling class. A ruling class is to some extent legitimized by the quality of the art that it patronizes. I should have thought the quantity of the food and the, the accommodation and the rations have a good deal to do with how impressed you are by the art forms. I mean, that could work for a while. But when you think that you've um, actually, you're, you're not the way of the future, you're at the wrong end. Cul-de-sac, spelled in Russian. Um, 
Why should the, the culture impress you? Especially if you know that the culture is controlled, uh, pandered to if you suck up to the party, repressed if you don't suck up to the party. People knew this. I mean, they'd get the best out of what there was, given coming their way. They, they'd enjoy it if it was in any way enjoyable. But that, that, that held the Soviet Union together and that kept it successful? No, for a while people believed in it, and those who didn't believe in it couldn't argue much against it. Uh, and there was a war on, and there were foreigners, and whatever. So it held together, but not for very long at all. The failings of Soviet socialism were manifest by about 1925, and yet the system only collapsed in 1991. Um, now, bear in mind it was based entirely on a misconception about human nature. That is the most remarkable achievement. And I think it is the artistic achievements of the Soviet elite which helped to keep it on the road as long as it did. I think being invaded by the Germans helped. I'm sure that helped. It helps to make a bit of a unit here yeah, of people that were being attacked. Yes. I think it also helps. Obviously, uh, when it came to when it came to a trench war between the two great totalitarian tyrannies, it was a matter of who could make more tanks and who could send more people into battle to soak up machine gun bullets. But uh, one of the reasons I think the Nazis lost the Second World War is because their arts were mediocre, whereas those of the Soviets were first rate. Whatever we in England and America did was of no was of no particular importance. I think America did a lot to uh, aid the fight back of the Soviet Union against Nazi Germany. And if America hadn't have aided uh, and abetted the Soviet Union, then I think the Nazis would have continued to win, and uh, they would have taken over. I think they'd have got bogged in, and they'd eventually have had to do something like Napoleon did. But, but, I don't, but I don't think you'd have had the counter attack. Uh, uh, the counterattack was basically based on American funds. Uh, that's a question of buying tanks and bullets, which are, of course, important in winning a war. But, all right, I have spent a long time looking at, I well, spent a long time listening to the music produced in Nazi Germany. And bearing in mind it was written by Germans, it, it, it's all rather mediocre. The only piece of the only piece of German music uh, from the 1930s that is still routinely performed is Karloff's Carmen and Burana. The rest of it is all borderline mediocre. Yet, if you look at the music written and performed in Soviet Russia, um, it, 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 a lot of it has made its way into the repertoire. And the only, the only possible justification I've ever seen of the Second World War is Shostakovich's Leningrad Symphony. If it hadn't been for the invasion of Russia and the siege of Leningrad, that symphony would not have been written. Now, now what I'm saying is that um, the quality and the nature of the arts that any political movement has are critical to its success or failure. And the reason why we, as I'm coming back to my central point, the reason why we have been such pathetic failures over the past 25 and over the past 40 years is because we have focused on pamphlets about the privatization of defense procurement and whether we should have private police forces taking people off to um, court. And we have completely ignored anything that could be described as cultural. And for that reason, after 40 years of arguing and writing and doing our very best, we are still fringe intellectuals. If we had put even half as much effort as we have into, um, into getting ballets performed, we'd probably be in a rather better position than we are today. David Goldstone. Yeah, I was wondering whether, the, throw this out of the question, whether you've got this the wrong way round. That, I mean, your thesis essentially is that the left in a broad sense, and today probably the sort of the social democratic consensus, which is what we're really talking about, uh, has, is successful because in part it has taken over culture. 
Well, one might say, well, it, it's the other way around. It's successful in culture because it's successful. Most people, the majority of people, appear to be sympathetic to social democratic ideas at all levels. And therefore, it's not surprising that those ideas, are, the people who hold those ideas, are heavily represented in culture, <clears throat> just as they're heavily represented in everything else. I mean, just I mean, to take an obvious example, the educational system is dominated by people who hold those sorts of social democratic ideas. Now, isn't that because the, there is a, a sort of plan by the centre-left to take over the education system? Possibly. Perhaps another explanation is that most people hold those ideas. So one might then need to stand back and say, uh, 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 uh. and so your diagnosis, let's see if we can populate culture with libertarian ideas, might be, as it were, uh, mistaking the symptom for the problem, which is, why is it that, to take an example of a recent poll, was it 55, 60% of potential voters said they were sympathetic to the ideas of the Labour Party. Now, they weren't saying that they were going to vote Labour, but there seems to be a sort of general feeling that that's broadly a good thing. Uh, and one might say that's the real problem, not the fact that the arts or education or a whole load of other, uh, uh, a whole load of other sectors of society are uh, numerically overrepresented. Sorry, not overrepresented, represented uh, by the uh, by those who hold social democratic ideas. Sorry, that was a very long statement. Uh, okay. short question. Why not be? Why not? You've taken the job to come out here, so why shouldn't you have a say? And it, no, okay, you've made a point. Um, perhaps I'm seeing, perhaps I'm mistaking uh, symptoms for causes. I don't think I am. Let me give. Let me give this example. Let's take homosexuality. Remember and that, why not? And why not, indeed? Remember that film, uh, Victim, Dirk Bogart, yes, yes. Sylvia Sims, isn't it? Yes. Yes. Now, now, back in the early 1960s, it was a consensus that, that homosexuality was either a very bad thing indeed, or was a very serious medical condition. In either case, it was not something that should be approved. You should worry if your son showed homosexual inclinations. The dispute was whether we should treat it as a crime or as a sickness. That, that seems to have been the main part of the debate. Indeed, in the 1970s, when I was a schoolboy, um, because I used to write essays arguing that if um, two men wanted to engage in a bit of bum fun, it was no one else's business. And there was actually nothing wrong with it if that's what they wanted to do. It wasn't just a question of it doesn't hurt third parties, it just doesn't matter. People gave me all manner of funny looks and um, said that if I held those opinions, why, I must be a shirtlift to myself, which caused me a certain amount of um, concern, just as it does nowadays when people call me a Nazi. However, that mass of prejudice, which I well remember existing in the 1970s, has evaporated. It's gone. A most remarkable achievement. What caused that? Was it people like me and Chris Tame saying, well, you know, if, if two consenting adults wish to do this sort of thing, it's none of our business? I don't think so. Is it Peter Tatchell marching through the streets? No, I don't think so at all. The, Peter Tatchell has had much more um, success than Chris Tame and I ever did. What caused that great mass of prejudice to evaporate was the was the cultural normalization of homosexuality. You start with films like Victim, with Dirk Bogart and Sylvia Sims, in which homosexuality is shown to be a, an aberration which deserves sympathy. 
Uh, and then through a series of intermediary stages, which I can't be bothered to describe, you, you get to My Beautiful Laundrette, which is a gay romance popular film. Uh, and then you go through all of those other British films of the 1990s and 2000s, in, in which it seems to be required that there should be a moment of gayness. Remember in Billy Elliot, where you have two boys and one of them is obviously gay, and uh, being it like Beckham, where one of the characters is superfluously gay. And um, what's that film, what's it called, what's it called? Um, the Full Monty. That's it. You have an entirely detachable scene, um, which is the moment of gayness. Now, what has happened is that homosexuality has been normalized through popular culture. 50 years ago, even 40 years ago, maybe even 35 years ago, homosexuality was an aberration, and the question was how we deal with it. And not by a process of libertarian argument, but purely through a process of cultural normalization. Homosexuality has become a matter of no particular importance. And, and I suggest that that is an example of how control of the arts, of how cultural hegemony can translate into political success. Nick? <coughs> yeah, um, it, is, it is of course very hard to, to determine what, what exactly is cause and what is effect because mm. they're, they're very, very close together. But I'm, I'm not sure if, if, if it's exactly the way around, as you say, just like, like David just uh, mentioned. Uh, I think. Because I, I work, I work in, in, in film post production, and I, I know a lot of producers and directors, and uh, I, I see them trying to to think like uh, like an entrepreneurs thing who try to sell products. They they try to make up their mind what do people want to see, and then they produce what they want to see, and that that is generally how markets seem to work if, if, you, if you see i mean it's, it's an old cliche of the left against capitalism that capitalists can just uh, sell anything to to the people because they they just brainwash people with advertisement and so on i don't i didn't i mean of course advertising has it has an influence but i generally don't find this to be true i generally think that the people tend to know what they want, and if they want to watch a film or, or a series, they go for what they are attractive to, and not so much what, what uh, film producers want them to see. Because if that was true, they would watch all these, these European subsidized films that, that, that uh, um, the uh, ruling class is trying to, to throw on people to, to, to watch, but they don't want to see it. What they want to see is um, the, the latest uh, Disney film or, uh, or uh, any, any other um, rom-com that, that follows the same script all over from Hollywood because um, they, they give people what, 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 they, what they want to see and not, not, not the other way around. So that makes me think maybe uh, you, you get cause and effect a little bit the wrong way. Not necessarily. Um, when, the, when the communists were big in Hollywood, in the 1940s, that they laid down a series of rules which have been followed ever since. And one of the rules was that you take a theme which, is, which has a wide popular resonance and you inject a communist message into that. Um, all, all sorts of advice given to communist filmmakers in the 1940s uh, because, because people like Sam Goldwyn were rather paranoid about communism uh, and because he, he was quite willing to pull films if he thought they were un-American, what you do is you have the most communistic statements uttered by it when you have people, when you have Dirk Bogard, Sidney Greenstreet, Lauren Bacall, Peter Laurie, etc., all in the set, or all in that scene, 
And when the marketing people say, you can't cut that scene because you'll gut the film. Films like um, My Beautiful Dawn Dreams are very good, they're very good stories. And they have a specifically gay message injected into them to bring about political change through via popular culture. I'm not saying there's a conspiracy to do this, I'm just saying that that's what's been done. And you see, instead of... Now, all right, I sound like a conspiracy theorist in his bunker with a, with a tinfoil helmet saying, yeah, I don't have a television set because it's filled with communist messages. <laughs> but you see, it is. <laughs> and instead of complaining about it, the purpose of my talk tonight is to suggest that we should do the same ourselves. Why are we not doing it? Why are we sitting around dribbling about um, the privatisation of the police when we could be writing novels that um, present social workers in a bad light? Well, uh, I come back to the point I tried to make earlier and has made much better since, David and Nico, that you're reversing cause and effect. The artists want something to believe in, something new, something novel, something hard edge, something that will get them in, something which excites them. Now, after a while, they can just do it through routine because they're quite good at what they do. This will literally be this was the Soviet Union in the 1930s. And of course, if you don't do it, you, you don't get employed, so they, they employ their talents as best they may. But it's more convincing if people tend to believe all this stuff. But they can't just believe it by reading a novel without any content that foams them out a bit about this and that. They get the ideas, basically, essentially, of the sort that we peddle. So the ideas have to come first, and then an artist will go, yes, of course, yes, 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 yes. No, you don't want to do this. It's important I do this. I can make a fortune. I can get famous. We have no objection to any of that going on. We aren't stopping it. Indeed, in some small measure, we hope that we're bringing it about. But you can't say, you can't just wait for a Bernard Shaw to turn up. You hope that they turn up. But Bernard Shaw was inflamed by the ideology. He was. Yes, I know, but... Oh, well, so we have to spread the ideology and hope that the artists come along. All right. Before you can have a J.B. Priest leader to Harold Lasky, fair enough, that's true. But our movement is full of Harold Lasky's and there are J.B. Priestley's. That's the problem. We have any number of people presenting the ideas, though I might ask how many libertarian masterpieces of political thought have been written since the 1960s, probably half a dozen. We, we have any number of um, people spraying out libertarian ideas, but almost no one incorporating them into uh, cultural messages of wider resonance. David Goldstone again. Uh, it might have said that's slightly unfair criticism because those, uh, those on the left who are the cultural producers are not usually the same people as thinkers. Oh. So it, it's a bit unfair to suggest that uh, avowedly libertarian activists and the like should be the people who should go out and write the ballet and produce the plays. What one does want to see, and I entirely agree with this, is one would like to see uh, in popular culture, films and novels and so on and so forth, that although they may not have hard edge libertarian themes, have a sort of general theme that is broadly synthetic to ideas of liberty. Now, I wonder whether you're being a bit uh, also, probably perhaps a, a, a bit harsh, perhaps being a, a little lacking in optimism, perhaps, because I just think of my own daughters, who were obsessed with a series of films called The Hunger Games. So I thought, well, I'd better read them. So I, I managed to force my way through one of the more organised one of the films. I don't think they're very good. But if you ask yourself, what's the theme? The broad theme is big, bad, nasty, totalitarian and the state trying to tell people what to do. And a bunch of individuals trying to fight against that. Now, 
you might say, well, that's not really libertarian in the sort of deep sense. That's that's a sort of just a sort of woolly uh, uh, idea that that nasty governments are nasty, and we can all agree with that. But it did seem to me that there was certain elements of individualism and sort of pro liberty. Mm. And there are plenty of other films about it. Almost actually, I would have thought the majority of popular culture films that have any sort of uh, uh, theme of good versus bad, generally the bad actually tends to be bad governmenty type, authoritarian types, and the good tends to be, broadly speaking, individuals trying to do stuff. Mm. So, so aren't you being a, perhaps a bit pessimistic? No, you're talking about American popular culture, which is an entirely different thing from British popular culture. I think that uh, Matthew Broderick and the makers of Ferris Bueller's Day Out did more for libertarianism in the 1980s than the collected publications of the Cato Institute, despite its $20 million budget. And libertarianism would be doing a great deal better in this country if instead of relying on cultural import from the United States, there was a libertarian counterculture here among us. That, that is the problem. Now, because we speak English, we can, um, we can piggyback on the considerable and distinguished output of American cultural libertarianism. But it would help enormously if there were a British cultural libertarianism, and I have seen almost none. A film called Children of Men. I can't remember. There was a film about 10, 15 years ago, a British film. It seemed to be, to be shot through with libertarian ideas. That's one book by a PG Jerry. That's the one. Yeah. Ah, yes. Or would you say, well, that's a, a one off? I wouldn't say it was a one off, but I'd say that it was too small to have a significant impact. We need more, much more. Oh, As far as high culture is concerned, I'm not a massive consumer of it, but it seems that it's overwhelmingly dominated by old stuff, Shakespeare, classical ballet. I don't think there's that much new ballet that especially shoveling socialistic messages at us. Um, and I don't know what a libertarian ballet would look like. Um, but um, but in terms of the popular culture, it's, I know, it's quite true that most of the popular comedians and television shows are pushing politically correct and those best sort of messages I've seen. You know, nearly all, all, all the most popular comedians uh, are um, the latter. And, and the few that are, say, perhaps Jim Davidson or something like that, you know, tend to be really fine and marginal. Although he did win Celebrity Big Brother, you know, he came across as the most popular person. And, uh, and on, the, on the more recent Big Brother, um, it was won by um, Katie Price, uh, Jordan the model, not especially socialistic, and the runner-up was Katie Hopkins, who was saying explicitly sort of free market libertarian type thing. So there is a sort of, a sort of attraction, that kind of popular thing. And a lot of, uh, if you watch, I quite like Big Brother, let's watch it, but the more socialist characters it, um, Nadia Sawala and that, and uh, Paris Hilton were hated and despised, and they were the political transitions captains, and they were, they were uh, thought to be awful. So I don't think it's as bleak as it seems, but, uh, but I think, yes, you're quite right, something like Comic Relief is just a, a, almost a market front, you know, mm. the, by the BBC, and uh, uh, it's, it's just shady, it's just endless, you know, green socialist mm. um, propaganda shoved at us um, all the time, and um, uh, but but that, that, that occasionally, you know, you, you get a comedian breaks right. I think Griff Rhys Jones has said one or two things uh, that's a bit libertarian more recently, and you've had a few, you've had a few smiling class has uh, said a few things as well. So it's not that, but but you're quite right that I think last year in popular culture there was a chap called Dapper Laughs, who was explicitly sort of um, right wing individualistic. Irreverent and that, and he was sort of hounded out of his job by feminists who managed to uh, absolutely clear. And if you read anything about this at all, but a few said he ended up going on news nights sort of uh, groveling for forgiveness and begging for his career. That was a particular mm. crime. But yes, yeah, certainly the last few years have seen, have seen a sort of 
feminism and green and uh, politically correct issues on the rampage have been rampant uh, and on the up, which is uh, more so than even when the Labour have been in power because Cameron is just as bad, if not worse, than the rest of them. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think the, 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 the total degeneration of the Conservative Party into political correctness is one of the, which it didn't used to be, but it is now. It's, it's just absolutely captured. Uh, by I mean, it, it, I'm amazed that they're doing things like bringing in plain pack cigarettes and every sort of pronouncement is just there's just it's just there's absolutely no trace of anything remotely like libertarianism in the current Conservative Party, uh, and I think they are trying to. It's because they're following the popular culture, they're mm -hmm. trying to make themselves popular with the people they think are doing it. But it's it's not relentlessly bleak. But as far as high culture is concerned, it just seems to me that it's, it's dominated by the past. So. The, the YouGov, I mean, the YouGov polls, did you see the YouGov polls last, uh, talking about the under 25s? Uh, liberal on social issues and uh, against the welfare state. <laughs> Since the last few years, you know, the under 25s, the, the majority, have been against the welfare state and liberal on social issues. Um, and look at the uh, the new good polls on this coming up. They'll probably repeat it. So that 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 doesn't look like a, a dominance of the social democrats. Oh, it David, looks like looks like the country. David, you're even older than I am. But let me <laughs> let me. Uh, in August 1979, I looked at the first issue of Now Magazine, brought up by James Goldsmith. <clears throat> And it had a long article about the political opinions of young people. The reason I read the article was because I thought both of the young people shown were rather attractive. Um, and they were saying exactly the same, that these people are socially liberal, but conservative in economics, etc., etc. Well, sorry, that was 40 years ago, yeah. and we are where we are now. Um, the same polls? <laughs> yeah, I don't believe anything about the young. They're probably, they're probably false polls, but that's about what the poll said. Look, it's, uh, every five, every few years or so, someone brings out another opinion poll or other long survey of young people which show that libertarians are winning. Well, you know, if, if libertarians are winning, why are we living in the sort of sewer state in which we live now? I should point out the position of gays in the modern world, excuse me for jumping in, is a libertarian thing. Yes, it's a good thing. I mean, it needs to be... Uh, there shouldn't be no tax funding, and it shouldn't be compulsory. But apart from that, this seems to be a victory of the liberal view on these matters. Not something socialistic, something rather John Stuart Milley, well, I should have thought. Well, something to be um, rather, 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 rather can, celebrated. It's to be celebrated. I can, I can recall in 1963, that, uh, when I joined the painting and decorating gang, there was Wolf, who was known as an homosexual on the gang. And you know, we were 15, we so, Keep an eye on Wolf, you know, he might be after you. <laughs> See, it's beware of him. But no one sat Wolf, or you know, he'd been there for donkey's years, and he retired and perhaps later on. Yeah, but it, it, it was, and then it was against the law to be an homosexual, but no one said, well, get the police on old Wolf, or... Not to be one. To do the deed. To do the deed, oh, well, he tried to do his best as a deed. Given that libertarian activists only have a certain uh, uh, quantity of time and energy and money at their disposal, how can they best use it, that time, money, and, uh, and energy, to, uh, to help nudge the world, and particularly the UK where we live, in a slightly more libertarian direction? Uh, now, your suggestion is uh, ballet and, uh, and the arts and, and, and uh, Understand the novels of my friend Mr. Novels, films, so forth. Uh, Please, it, it might be said, uh, and I'm not here to defend the Adam Smith Institute, but it might be said that a more fruitful route in terms of what we, relatively small, small bang, which we are, include the think tanks and so on and so forth. The more fruitful route would be to try and make a difference to that part of people's lives when their views are being formed, which is school and university, i.e. culture.
culture in the education sense rather than the sort of culture that the, you can talk about. So, for example, if he were here, Eamon Butler might say, well, we the Smith Institute go out of our way every year to have a sort of student thing where we try and, uh, we try and get as many students as we can and we try and talk to them Uh, because that is something that we can actually do, and actually if you do want to get people sympathetic to libertarian ideas, it might be quite a good, quite a good idea to start being to be young if you can, and that's something that we can actually do. What was it I've always had a sneaking regard for Madison Peary. In fact, it's very difficult to dislike Madison Peary. But I do think that the entire strategy of the Adam Smith Institute is grossly misconceived. It has had, it has spent money on outreach to the young, but it hasn't, it hasn't fished in young people of any particular quality. And um, this is widening the debate away from where I want to be. But, but I would suggest that the the main achievement of the Adam Smith Institute since 1977 has simply been to give us more of the government we have to pay for. Uh, it, it, thanks to Madison Peary and Avon Butler that uh, civil servants don't clock off at 3.30 on f Friday afternoon, but now because they're, because they're all on various bonuses and incentives, they carry on until 7 o'clock on Friday afternoon and they work hard the rest of the week uh, trying to find ways to make our lives a misery. I, I think, as I said, I do like Madison Peary in spite of everything and I'm probably not as contemptuous of Eamon Butler as I may have, sound this evening, may have sounded this evening but I do think that the net effect of the Alan Smith Institute over the past 38 years has been negative. <coughs> um, risk of being heretical, what if, if all of, I, I tend to agree with this, this bit about cause and effect and where we're getting it possibly the wrong way around, but what if the reason why um, where we are where we are within, it would appear, all the world's reasonably free, mature democracies is this social democratic, mixed economy, welfare, capitalist, whatever you want to call it, is because that is in fact left to our own devices on aggregate, the default position of mankind. And that, that libertarians, just like communists, except we have not death spots, um, overrate logic and reason and how far they can shift the natural predispositions of humans. Not individual humans, there'll be, there'll be individual humans at the end, the tails of distribution curve, or this or that psychometric measure, who will indeed be voluntarily socialistic with even a monastic movement, for example. And there are indeed three free thinkers who lead wild bohemian lives. But that is not, in fact, how the bulk of humanity operates. And that we as libertarians, and I still consider myself one, albeit of a much more wishy-washy type these days, have to recognise that the limits of play are narrower than we once thought in the kind of glory days when you and I first met. And we need to be much more modest in our ambitions. But we do. Okay. There are better ways of delivering old... There are better ways of looking after the old than a state-funded old-age pension system, but we are what we are. Uh, there are better ways of providing mass health care than the National Health Service, but we are where we are. But all age pensions and, um, and National Health Service general practitioners do not necessarily lead to criminal convictions of bakers who refuse to provide wedding cakes for gay weddings. And they do not necessarily lead to bans on the display of cigarettes in um, supermarkets. Uh, and they don't lead to the whole array 
of political correctness under which we now live. I want to say that, that I agree with you. Mm. That is, that is the, the, the bits that we are talking about education that are wrong. There are those bits that we, we can shift that must be seen in the context of, if you will, what we were talking about earlier on, our genetic predispositions. Yes. We, are, we are animals who have certain limits to what, how we tend to act and think and act. Mm. And the things that you're talking about are those specific things that come up from time to time. Yes, they can be changed for good and for real. Mm. We talk about heterosexuality, and yeah, Christ, that must be regarded as, as a major um, benefit of the last last few decades. And these are important things, undoubtedly, but they are limits. And certainly, those who argue for sort of radical free market, minimal state, anarcho capitalists a stable, peaceful society, I think are frankly kidding themselves. Well. It may be that arguing for anarcho-capitalism is a non-starter. I hope it isn't, but it may well be. But the point is, you can have, and I know this because I lived through it, you can have a social democratic welfare state with a very high degree of political and personal freedom. And so you can take the, uh, you can even take the whole of the beverage Atlee settlement off the table and say, well, that's a given, we can't change it. But there's still a great mass of other stuff which we could take issue with, but don't, because we have no culture on our reach. I, I accept that. Mm -hmm. That's the point I'm making. We need to distinguish between, we need to do for those things we can, I can give a density last from about what we can and can't change, mm -hmm. but I think at times there has been a, you know, Wildly sort of fantastical ideas of, of, of how far we can go. And I said, unlike the you know, communism is equally nonsense, communism is mm. completely nonsense. I'm afraid I, I agree with some of our other commentators. You know, I don't think it was high culture or Shostakovich that kept the communists in power. It was their win they, they were willing and able to kill an endless amount of people. Well, I don't think that kept them in power either. You know, I think the major thing that keeps the ruling class in power and the government, as government, we all need a government, is tradition. Tradition is the major reason why, and, and then, of course, the reason why socialist groups think the right wing are dominant, as I said earlier on, and we think the left wing are dominant, is because we, it's the, the, what is dominant isn't according to our views. You know, you know, so uh, you know, I think you, 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 get, you listen to John Humphreys and something like that, who doesn't think he's left, he doesn't realise he's as left as he is, and there are people who come on and criticise him for being too right. So, you know, basically, John Humphreys is just a non ideological person doing his job under, under the day programme. But, you know, I think that there will be uh, anarcho-liberalism, but I don't think it's going to be in the next 10 years or 20 years. And, I, and back in, 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 in the 1970s, I didn't think that we were going to have anarchy by now, and it's been 40 years, oh my goodness, but we haven't made as much progress as I expected. No, I think in terms like David Hume did, so, yes, you are like David Hume. Uh, like David Hume, thinks, I think eventually there will be an anarcho liberal society. And by eventually, I certainly mean three, four, perhaps even 500 years' time. Yes, but David, you've just admitted that we haven't made as much progress in the past 40 years as you hoped we would. No, I, I said the opposite. I said, I said that we, we haven't, uh, I'm not disappointed by the progress we've made. I expect it's slow. Progress. There was a great deal more anarcho-capitalism in this country in the 1970s than there is today. Mm. Oh, there were government control. Uh, sorry, so. the government tried to control the price of bread, but it didn't try to. It, it didn't make it effectively impossible to conduct transactions in cash. Uh, you could do business off the books in the 1970s. I remember it well. Whereas today, it's very difficult to do that. Uh, we have been on the losing side, and we've been losing. We have lost, obviously and substantially, since 1990. I believed in 1990 that we had lost, obviously and substantially, since 1980. But um, wow. let's leave that to one side. We have been on the losing side, well, despite you, being in the right. You, you, you talk to those social democrats and see what he has to say. You'll say that Blair is such a mark too. Yes, because Margaret Thatcher is a Margaret Thatcher represented a new a new version of the post-war settlement.
part and um, part of the uh, what was privatisation is there? Well, one last thing. You shouldn't neglect the fact that um, we are not tax funded, and but the others are. They're in the chair and for a while. They have their say. But if things screw up, as they very well might, over the next year or so, given um, the unprecedented state of uh, finances of the government around the world. Um, if the road to recovery is a road never before trod, uh, I'd be very surprised that that's supposed to be the one we're on. So to be available at the time, and it wasn't the Bolsheviks by themselves, it, it was the Great War that got them into power, so in the same way, if there's a great, if there's a great recession, then people are going to cast about looking for uh, explanations for this, and we are available to make them. Then once those in a position of power start working upon those, uh, those analyses, then ballet, uh, ballet dancers and uh, theatre directors and the rest of them can come along, and they will. But at present, we are not subsidised, and we are not seen to be necessary. But the times can change, and we have to be available. I mean, not us necessarily, but uh, our views have to be there to be grasped hold. I think they are, and that's, that's the best we can do. You could be right, Bob, but um, I suspect that when things inevitably go tits up, the ruling class will get through them with inflation yes. and tax cuts for the, sorry, spending cuts for those at the bottom. And, and after a few years, the chaos will stabilise and the existing order of things will still be there. And on that cheery Yes. Yes. <laughs> Could you deal with the great secret cow, the BBC's influence, because that is a huge propaganda. Oh, the BBC. Oh, well, I... I and think nobody will touch it. Oh, no, well, um, sorry, the, the, um, the, the position of my, of my Libertarian Alliance... No, sorry, since the Libertarian Alliance is a charity now and has no uh, political opinions, my personal <laughs> opinion, as Sean Gabb, is that the BBC should be shut down, its employees should be kicked into the street and deprived of their pensions, and the entire output of the BBC should either be shredded or, 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 or just thrown into the public domain. Sorry. And um, if we did that, the BBC would no longer be a serious problem. If that right, wouldn't exist, I suppose. So nobody would do it. No. <laughs> the idea is to shut it down and destroy its operatives as far as humanly possible. <laughs> I mean, how did it become this sacred cow in Britain? It doesn't exist in America. Well, it's not all that much of it. Mean, it's not, 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 it's not like the National Service. That's the sacred cow yeah, in Britain. Yeah, it's, 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 it's not all. Yeah, you've got these sacred cows at that little time. Yeah. I suppose it's time to film. Thank you very much indeed. Oh, I've been... I've been very much indeed.